this is Tony Blazer for the Motocross Vault presented by Blinzall. If you're in the market for some high-quality racing oil for your two-stroke or four, make sure you go to Blinzall.com and use our discount code VAULT20 to save 20% at checkout. Thank you for all the support. Hey, I'm Grant Langston, and welcome to the Motocross Vault. Hello and welcome back to the Motocross Vault. My name is Tony Blazer, and what this video is going to cover is a look back at Honda's all-new CR125 for 1985. The CR125 was all new this year. It was a complete redesign. Pretty amazing. Honda was basically completely redoing their whole motocross lineup year to year. From 81 through 1985, the bikes were completely all new every year. 85 this year gets all new bodywork, a new frame, a majorly revised engine. They really were taking it and throwing the kitchen sink at these uh, bikes every year. And it's pretty crazy when you think about how much money they were spending on this stuff. Now, of course, the bikes were certainly simpler. They weren't like the modern four-strokes with fuel injection and stuff. But, I mean, if you were on a three-year-old bike in 85, that was a pretty big disadvantage. You know, now you can be on a decade-old machine, and unless you're racing the pro class, you're probably fine. Uh, but the mo machines were definitely changing a lot from year to year. In the 80s were a great time to be riding motocross. They were coming out with all new innovations. You had the linkage suspensions by this point were everywhere. You had liquid cooling. Power valves were really becoming common. It was a great era in terms of innovation, and the bikes were changing quite a bit from year to year. Now, Honda at the time was basically playing second fiddle to Kawasaki in the 125 division. They, KX had the most powerful machine in the class, and that was really all you needed to win the 125 division. You know, in a 125, the bikes are so you know, driven by the power characteristics of the motor. They all handle pretty well. They're very light. You know, a bike with not a lot of power tends to handle pretty well. And the really, the biggest disadvantage was if the motor was slow. And Honda was not terrible in 84, but they were, weren't quite nearly as powerful as the KX125. And for 85, Honda tried to come out with a new machine that was going to be more competitive. I think in most ways it was very successful, but it still didn't quite have the power. It would take them another year until 1986 to kind of finally get the, the upper hand on Kawasaki. But this is a great looking bike. I've actually ridden it quite a bit. Both my, my best buddies, Jamie and Trenton, had 85 CR125, so I've turned a lot of laps on this bike. And at the time, it was you know, I thought it was pretty mediocre. It's okay. The bike didn't nearly have the hit of, you know, some of the other machines I'd ridden at the time, and it didn't have spectacular power, but it handled well. It looked great. I love the looks, but the main takeaway I remember thinking was the motor was only, meh, it was mediocre, and that's pretty much what the most of the magazine thought. It was a decent overall engine, but it didn't have the wow factor of the Kawasaki at the time, and in 125s, you know, the motor has always been king, so that was definitely a bit of a handicap, but the bike did look great and handled well. Uh, so this video is going to look back at the history of that 85 CR. If you like this sort of thing, make sure you check out some of the videos I've done. I have videos covering all sorts of other machines from Honda, Kawasaki, Suzuki, Yamaha, even KTM. And if you'd like to support what I do, I do have Motocross Vault merch available. I have uh, merch available in my store. I'll put a link in the description below and a card here in the video. I have uh, Honda, Kawasaki. I have pretty, pretty much any design you want from Mueller Cycle State TVs available on my Teespring store. If you'd like to check that out and support what I do, I'd appreciate you uh, giving it a look. Uh, so here, without further ado, is the story of the 1985 Honda CR125. In 1985, Honda was far from the 125 powerhouse they would become a few short years later. While the CR125M Elsinore had turned the industry on its head in 1974, its subsequent follow-ups had failed to impress nearly as much. The all-new YZ125 and RM125 quickly eclipsed the Elsinore's performance and left the outdated Honda in their wake. In 1981, Honda tried to snatch back the title of Top 125 in the land with a radically redesigned CR125. The new machine featured a laundry list of high-tech innovations and spacey styling, but once again proved to be a disappointment on the track. Two years later, in 1983, Honda finally cracked the 125 code with an excellent all-around racer. The all-new 83 CR handled and looked like a works bike with Sano styling and razor-sharp turning. The motor and suspension were not world-beating, but overall, the CR125R for 83 offered the most well-rounded package in the class. In 1984, Honda once again totally redesigned the CR125R and introduced the Red Brigade to work style power through the introduction of their new Automatic Torque Amplification System, or ATAC. The ATAC consisted of a small subchamber off the exhaust port and a ball ramp governor controlling a butterfly valve. The concept behind the ATAC was to boost low end torque by increasing the headpipe volume at low RPM while still allowing proper flow at higher speeds for increased top end performance. While the theory behind the ATAC was sound, its early implementations turned out to be less than stellar. The 84 CR125 was slightly torquier than its shootout winning predecessor, but no match for Kawasaki's quasar-fast KX125. 
top end power was sorely lacking, and many tuners took to eliminating the ATAC altogether in search for more power. For 1985, Honda looked to take back the crown of best 125 in the land with yet another all new CR125. Nearly every component from the 84 machine was scrapped in search of more power, better handling, and improved suspension. The shock, forks, frame, motor, and bodywork were all new and designed with the goal of overthrowing Kawasaki's dominant KX125. The year before, the CR125 had been a very good bike saddled with a mellow engine. In the 125 class, that was paramount to a death sentence, and all of the Honda's other virtues were not enough to make up for its fairly mediocre power output. For 1985, Honda decided to stick with the ATAC, but reconfigured nearly every other component in their 8th liter engine. Both the bore and stroke were new, with an additional 3.3 millimeters of stroke and 1.5 millimeters less bore for 85. This resulted in a perfectly square 54 millimeters by 54 millimeters bore and stroke on the new mill. The crank was also redesigned, with new metal bushings replacing the fairly problematic plastic components of 84. The ATAC remained largely unchanged, but a new cylinder and head were added to accommodate the redesigned internal dimensions. The six-speed manual transmission remained and was largely a carryover from 84, but a new clutch was added and a new magnesium case replaced the aluminum components of the year before. Feeding the revised motor was a completely new 34mm PJ flat slide carburetor. This K-heating unit replaced the brass slide found in the 1984 version with a new lightweight oval zinc unit that promised better airflow and improved throttle response. Unlike the Makuni flat slide designs, the new PJ offered a conventional screw off top which aided access to the slide for jetting changes. There was also an innovative choke circuit that doubled as the bike's idle speed adjustment. On the track, the new 123.7cc motor proved a solid if not astounding improvement over the mellow 84 version. Low end torque was slightly less than 1984, but there was much more mid-range and slightly more top end than the old motor. Out of corners the bike was fairly slow to rev and a good deal of clutch abuse was necessary to get it into the meat of its power band. Once on the pipe, however, it pulled with authority through a solid mid-range and into a decent top-end pull. If you left the throttle on, the bike was happy to rev, but there was not a lot to be gained by screaming into the stops. Most of its usable thrust was found in the mid-range, and keeping it in this part of the power band yielded the best results. In terms of power band hierarchy in 1985, the new CR fit well above the anemic YZ and top-end only RM, but a notch below the brawny KX. It was both faster and broader than the two back markers, but not as outright powerful as the KIPS equipped Kawasaki. The KX offered far more low end and mid range with a similar pull on top. If it had offered more grunt, it could have perhaps given the KX a run for its money, but as it stood, it was the second best power package of 1985. On the chassis front, the all new frame for 85 increased rigidity considerably with a new box section down tube and beefed up steering stem. Geometry was also altered to better work with the new machine's redesigned ProLink rear suspension. A new swing arm was bolted on and connected to a 10mm longer KYB shock and a revised rising rate linkage. As it had been since 1983, the rear subframe remained fully removable, which was one of the only bikes in the class that offered this at the time. Up front, the new CR used a set of 43mm air adjustable conventional Kayaba forks for its suspension duties. Interestingly, this was a departure from the Showa components found on the CR250 and 500. These KYB units offered 11.2 inches of travel and adjustments for compression, but no rebound adjustability. With the introduction of Showa's cartridge fork still a year away, the CR's KYB forks used traditional damper rods for its damping control. In terms of suspension performance, the new CR was a bit of a mixed bag in 85. Up front, nearly everyone praised the comfort and control of the Honda's forks. Their 43mm sliders were beefy for the time, flex-free, and well damped. The spring rates were spot on for the average Tiddler pilot, and most riders could find suitable settings without resorting to oil and valving changes. Out back, however, the picture was not quite as rosy. The new ProLink suspension was supposed to offer smoother action than 84, but its actual performance was little improved. The KYB shock offered adjustments for compression or rebound damping, but no amount of adjustment seemed to calm down its busy action. Under braking, it hopped, chattered, and kicked, and under acceleration, it deflected instead of absorbing sharp hits. The spring rates and dampings were too light for even somewhat of moderate skill, and any serious aerial work was bound to result in a large burnt rubber strip underneath that beautiful rear fender. Perhaps most annoying, however, was the shock's suspect reliability. Without the benefit of hard anodizing on the shock's body, the internals tended to wear out very quickly, and within a few months of use, the CR damper was all but shot. In 1985, 
Finding replacement parts to rebuild it was also nearly impossible, and many savvy racers at the time were forced to turn to more robust aftermarket alternatives. On the handling front, the CR was an absolute dream on tight circuits, with excellent ergonomics, streamlined bodywork, lightweight, and sharp geometry. The CR could literally cut under anything else on the track. No line was too tight, and no off-camber was too tricky on the red scalpel. Jumping was also excellent, and the Honda felt feather light and maneuverable in the air. The flip side of this excellent cornering, however, was head shake violent enough to make you take up table tennis. At speed, the front of the bike never quite felt planted, and under braking, the CR could oscillate the bars hard enough to rip your hands clean off the grips. In the days before OEM steering dampers, the smart and free setup was to cinch down the steering head nut just tight enough to feel a little drag when turning. While this shade tree damping solution probably shortened the lifespan of your bearings a bit, it did help to extend the lifespan of your undershorts. As with most bikes of this era, the 85CR was a mixed bag of novel ideas and engineering missteps. On the plus side were the CR's excellent front disc, which was by far the best in the class, slick shifting, easy pulling and durable clutch, excellent looks, great grips, and trick removable subframe. In the thumbs down category were the Persnickety ATAC, which was dubiously effective and constantly in need of cleaning, wear prone shock, weak motor mounts, which tended to stretch out and broke over time, wimpy chain and sprockets, and squeaky rear drum brake. Interestingly, one of the CR's biggest engineering missteps in 1985 was something that didn't prove to be a problem until much farther down the line. In 1985, Honda decided to switch the inch cases on all the full-size CRs from aluminum to magnesium. While this did not cause any immediate issues, anyone who has looked at restoring one of these old mid-80s CRs will be quite familiar with the effects the coolant had on these magnesium components. Over time, that coolant would slowly turn from a liquid into a thick paste as the magnesium rotted away. If left unattended, it could ruin both the coolant system and the engine cases themselves. While the 1985 CR125 did have its share of small annoyances, it was certainly no worse, and in many cases much better than its competition. The Kawasaki, Suzuki, and Yamahas of the time all offered inferior build quality and overall workmanship to the red machine. In the case of the Kawasaki, it was incredibly fast, but prone to cracked frames, broken linkage arms, and fractured plastic bits. Fit finish, component quality, and overall durability was a cut above on the Honda. None of the 125s and 85 were perfect, but if you were looking for a bike that could take abuse and keep right on going, the Honda was the best bet at the time. In the final standings, the 85 Sierra 125R ranked just below the KX125 in most magazine shootouts. The Honda handled better, stopped faster, and had superior forks, but it lacked the meaty burst of the powerhouse Kawasaki. On a 250 or 500, its slight power disadvantage might not have been enough to outweigh its other virtues, but in the 125 class, power was everything. It was a great bike with a middling shock and a moderately potent motor. For junior and intermediate class racing, the CR125 was a great machine, but in the expert class, it was hard to overlook the massive power advantage Kawasaki had in 1985. So there you have it. That's a look back at the 1985 Honda CR125R, a machine that was pretty much a motor away from being the best machine in the class, a year later in 1986, Honda would finally rectify that with a machine that had much more grunt and an awesome power band, and then it would pretty much dominate the class for the next few years. Uh, this 85 machine was almost there. A lot of the basic DNA that the 86 machine had is here in the 85, uh, but it needed a little more power to unseat the Kawasaki at the time. As I said, I've ridden this bike quite a bit. It was a good overall machine, but I know from experience my 87, uh, even though it's only two years removed from this, way faster CR125 than this 85. The 85, mellow, easy to ride, certainly. Um, it could have used a little bit more torque, in my opinion, but overall it was a good bike, and certainly Honda sold a ton of them. They were very popular, and it's a good-looking machine. I love the styling still to this very day. It's a great-looking bike. Uh, this 85, though, Honda was just on the cusp of finally kind of taking over the class, and they weren't quite able to do this one year, but uh, very quickly the CRs would be the machines to have across the board. Uh, if you like this sort of thing, make sure you check out some of the other videos I've done. If you could like, subscribe, and share on social media, I would very much appreciate it. And until we meet again, this is Tony Blazer from Motocross Vault. Keep the rubber side down. Peace. <laughs>